Well, let's take a moment in prayer, please. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And we have learned to lean upon your word. And our Father, as we come tonight to your word, we pray for help. We ask, Lord, that by your spirit you will speak. We recognize, our Father, uh, our task is simply to minister from the word. It's the Spirit's task to minister through the Word. And so we commit that to you, our Father. Pray that we will see tonight the Holy Spirit at work, even as the messages and song have gone out, as the Word is preached. May it be that God is at work. For this we pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Text this evening, as you have no doubt already assumed uh, or been watching, is simply that beautiful verse in verse 18 that we read, For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You know, dear friends, the Word of God, as we've been hearing tonight, the Word of God is the dunamis or the dynamite of God to blow sin out of the heart. Faith comes by hearing. The scripture tells us in Romans, <laughs> Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God is the dynamite that can deal with the sin question like nothing else can. But you see, this dynamite that I'm talking about, the girls have been singing about, uh, friends, must be ignited by the light of faith must be ignited. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the Word of God. And it's as the Word of God is preached that the Holy Spirit can take that Word and can work in the heart and move with power and authority, bringing conviction of sin, bringing the realization that if we die without Christ, we will forever be separated from God. But knowing that if we trust Him, believe on Him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you will be saved. I know there's a, an easy believism that has arisen today out of the New Age doctrine. I don't know if you heard Sunday sequence this morning and listened to all uh, the silliness that we're talking about, the New Age movement. And it took a, a priest, would you believe, to come on there, tell them how far wrong they were. And that's the new easy believism that has arisen out of the New Age doctrine in these days, friends. And it's being pressed upon people. Namely, just forgive yourself. That's their theory. That's their teaching. Suppose someone comes up here tonight and punches me in the face and says, Oh, preacher, it's all right. Don't you worry. I forgive me. Where does that leave me? I mightn't forgive him so easy. I, know I might have to call Tommy up here to hit him a punch in the face. You see, friends, none can forgive but God. That's the, the message of this lovely text that we read. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You see, the purpose of the cross, dear friends, was that Jesus would become the, uh, the um, substitutional sacrifice for humankind, the just for the unjust, the text says. Remember, Jesus didn't die as a martyr. Martyrs are those who are put to death tragically. But many of them may have just loved to have lived longer and served the Lord. You see, the whole purpose of Jesus' coming was that he would die willingly, that he would walk into death, as it were, that he would give himself. He did not die as an example. His death is a wonderful example uh, of complete surrender to, to God, but that's not why Jesus died. Jesus died to be a substitute for sinners. He took our place. He stood in our stead, and he gave himself, his life, 
for you and for me. Without Jesus doing that, God could never have forgiven sins. Isn't that amazing? I know the liberal preachers today want to draw us away from this wonderful truth, the doctrine of substitution. But the Bible teaches that Christ died the just for the unjust. Jesus died a substitute for you and me. And we might well say, but why? Why should Jesus die for me? Why should Jesus die for others? Well, you see, friends, God is a holy God. God is infinitely righteous and just. Thus, God has a hatred of sin, and that's why Jesus had to die, to pay the penalty for sin that God demanded. You see, God, as we saw this morning around the table, God has always demanded an offering for sin, always. Throughout all of Old Testament times, God demanded an offering for sin. And the Israelites, God's earthly people, were continually sacrificing one animal or another <coughs> in order to um, be what God determined, to do what God determined, to, be, to give an offering for sin. But you see, all of those offerings, dear friends, were just a great big cover-up. All that God could do in those days through those offerings was cover up the sin. It wasn't until Jesus came to the cross. It wasn't until Jesus shed his precious blood. It wasn't until Jesus went into the grave and lay dead in the grave, having given himself as a sacrifice for sin that mankind needed. It wasn't until he rose again from the dead that, Jesus, that God could, on Jesus' behalf, he could cleanse every sin. He could forgive every sin. That's why he was able to put every sin behind his back. That's why he was able to bury our sins in the depths of the sea. That's why he was able never to remember our sins anymore forever because of the cross. The just for the unjust. Now I'm, I'm aware tonight that this word sin is outdated. And many today mock at the, the whole idea. That's the reason few can accept or understand the, the doctrine of substitution. But you see, dear friends, if we pick up any newspaper today or listen to any newscast, we we'll read stories and that horrify us. Violence from every corner of the world. People who are involved in uh, theft and rape and drugs and pornography and drink-related crimes. Yet in all of those reports, either newspaper or newscast, you will never once hear the word sin. Society talks about all kinds of behavioral problems, but nobody ever talks about sin. And yet, dear friends, in this little island of ours, Northern Ireland, this part of the island, Northern Ireland, do you know that in this little island tonight, in the 30 minutes or so I've been given to preach here, uh, that there will be five teenage girls who will have an abortion? Do you know that there will be six teenage girls who will give birth outside the marriage bond? Do you know that there will be over 30 children physically and sexually abused by their parents or by some relative within this 30 minutes? Do you know that five children will become the victims of broken home syndrome in this 30 minutes? You see, sin is destroying the very soul of our country. That's why we're in the state we are in. And it's ruining our children, snatching them away and ruining them for life. And because God is holy and man is sinful, I want to tell you, friends, tonight, with all of the unction, function, and emotion of my soul, as sure as I stand here before you this evening, as sure as there's a God in heaven, and no ands and ifs and buts about it, let me tell you, it's all sin that has caused our world to be in the state it's in today. Please let that sink in. 
You see, God cannot overlook sin. There must be a punishment. There must be a price. The only question is, if Jesus Christ did not bear the punishment for sin, who will? And the answer, of course, is we will. There must be someone stands in the breach between God, a holy God, and sinful man, and says, at your bidding, Father, I have finished the work that you give me to do. On the cross, you remember, Jesus cried, it is finished, or tetelestai is the word that he used. Finished, it's complete. And you remember when Jesus went back, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, indicating that the work of Calvary was finished and it satisfied a holy God. Your sin, dear friend, you see, will be pardoned in Christ or punished in hell. That's something we don't like hearing or talking about. But it's a fact. The purpose of the cross, that Jesus would become a substitutionary sacrifice. The price of the cross. And the price of the cross is that Jesus would become a suffering sacrifice. The text we read said, once suffered. Once suffered. You see, the thought mind, the, the mind really, by thought, cannot conceive. As someone has said, the tongue cannot tell. Uh, the throat cannot sing. The time cannot paint the tragedy that was Calvary. Gather the wail of an icy wind, said the poet, and as it howls through the frozen north, extract the heart despair of a mother helplessly watching wild beasts tear at the throat of her precious child. Capture all the helpless groans and hopeless shrieks of the damned in hell. And with all of this at your command, you will still be unable to picture the reason for Calvary, the sufferings of Calvary. Oh, the sufferings of Calvary, friend. And friend, this text tells us that sin carries with it sufferings. And sin demands a high price. The Bible says, sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. You see, there's always a price to pay for sin. Someone has to pray, pay the price to satisfy the demands of a holy and of a just God. See, we pay a price for sin even today. And you might say to me, well, I'm sinning, but I don't pay a price. Let me tell you this, friends. Sin will always extract a price. If you fool about with a, a life of promiscuity, you can be sure you will pick up some disease that will probably end your life prematurely. You fool about with drugs, and you will discover that sinning with, were against the body with foreign uh, bodies or drugs, you will extract a price. It will extract a price from you. You will die younger than you had ever intended. <coughs> you jump off a 30-story building and you won't break the law of dynamics, if you like, or the, the, the law of gravity. You'll break your neck. There is a built-in judgment to sin today, but that's not the judgment that God's talking about. You see, dear friends, there's a, a judgment yet to come, and that's the great white throne of judgment that's spoken of in Revelation 20, where we read the books will be opened. And those who stand before the great white throne of judgment, they will be judged out of those books that are open. And as they are judged, they will be cast away from God forever into the second death. 
And that second death, of course, is where the fire is not quenched. That second death, dear friends, is where, uh, which was made for the devil and his angel. It's called hell. And that's where that judgment of God comes. Yes, there are judgments to sin. There's a price to be extracted. And you may pay it or Jesus Christ will pay it. The text reminds us there's the purpose of the cross, the price of the cross, and then the permanence of the cross. And the permanence of the cross says not only once suffered, but that word once gripped my attention. It's a settled sacrifice. This is the wonderful thing about the sacrifice Jesus gave. In Romans 1, 4, we read that Jesus Christ was the original word in there in the Greek text is horizon or declared to be the Son of God because of his resurrection, because of his, his death, his burial, and, his, and his, of his resurrection. You see, what God was saying by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, listen, world, I have accepted what Jesus did. I have accepted Jesus' words. I have accepted him as the way back to me. There's no other way. And let, let me tell you, that sacrifice only needs to be done once means it's never to be repeated. That word once means it's never to be repeated. When Jesus died on the cross, the sin debt was settled, paid in full. God's justice had been absolutely satisfied. And all those who believe in Jesus will have their debt paid in full. God will not twice demand, once at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine, someone prayed this evening in the prayer meeting. Sometimes people tell me that they can lose their salvation. But do you know what that would mean, friends? That would mean that Jesus would have to come and die all over again. Listen to this. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting to make his enemies his footstool. When Jesus, as I said earlier, finished the work and went back to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God, indicating that God was satisfied with his work. But listen to this even further. Hebrews 10, 14 this time. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. You see, if we get this theology straight tonight, we will know that Christ has once suffered for sins. For by one sacrifice he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Friends, that means we could never lose our salvation. That means that when we're saved, we are saved. Once, one sacrifice, by one sacrifice he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Forever. Suppose you could lose your salvation. Do you realize what that would mean? I've already said it. Jesus would have to come again and die on the cross all over again. But the Bible says, listen, it was one sacrifice for sin. And by that sacrifice, he perfects all who come to him. It's finished. That's why Peter and John could, the hour of prayer in Acts 3, walk up to the temple. And as they walked, they could see this beggar man begging. And you can imagine the scene. We have seen them in Israel when we've been there, sitting and begging on the street and covering their, hand, their face with their arm or maybe a piece of shawl, putting their hand out or a cup or a plate and crying, bakshis, bakshis, arms, arms, because they're ashamed to have to beg. And when Peter and John came along and this, this beggar who had been there from a childhood, a child, remember he, he, he couldn't walk and therefore he couldn't work. And because he was crippled, he wasn't allowed into the temple. He couldn't worship. And therefore, he had no witness. And he sat there day after day for years begging. And when Peter and John come along, he was begging, alms, alms, bakshish, bakshish. And Peter looked at him and he said, I'm sorry, I have no money. But I tell you what, what I have, I'll give you. What was it he had? Jesus. That was enough. You see, friends, that's the wonder of God's salvation. Jesus is 
enough. There's a permanence about the work of the cross. It's a settled sacrifice. But then there's the power of the cross in the text. And it becomes a sufficient sacrifice that he might bring us to God. Here's the purpose. What's Jesus dying for? Surely God could have found found another way. No, there was only one way. No man comes unto the Father but by me, said Jesus. And here's the reason that he might bring us to God. That's why he died. This was to be a sufficient sacrifice. That's why Jesus died on the cross, dear friends, that he might bring us to God. Can you imagine it? Jesus died that he might bring you and me into an eternal relationship with God. Talking to the children this morning about the the, um, wonderful treasure that we have. That is our soul. And you remember that the Old Testament says that God breathed into man the breath of life. In the authorized version, it says he became a living soul. But in the Hebrew Hebrew text, it says he became an eternal soul. And that's what God did when he breathed into man the breath of life. Mankind became living, eternal souls. Do you know, dear friends, that you have a soul will live as long as God lives somewhere? You look, in, look into the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, and you'll see there a picture that, that we're given of two men. One was a beggar, sat at the, the gate of the rich man. The other was the rich man. And we see them both after they have died on the other side of the grave. And we get this picture. And whenever the rich man lifts up his eyes, he sees Abraham and Lazarus the beggar that sat at his gate day after day, eating the crumbs that he dusted from his table. And he saw Lazarus now in Abram's bosom being prepared for heaven. He couldn't go into heaven because Jesus hadn't yet died. But Abraham was preparing him. He was in paradise. He was preparing him for heaven. But whenever we hear the rich man, He says, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus? You see, he knew who this was. He knew who Abraham was, and he certainly knew who Lazarus was. He recognized him. So on the other side of the grave, he was alert, he was alive, and he was able to talk. Will you send Lazarus and dip the tip of his finger in water? For I am, what? Thirsty. He says, Send him that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, for I thirst. He was conscious of thirst. And then he said, for I am tormented in this flame. He was conscious of torment. And you know something else he was conscious of, friends? He was conscious of truth. He said, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus back? I have five brothers back home. I don't want them coming to this place. And I'm putting in a few words of my own there. But that's what it was about. He didn't want the five brothers coming there because he had heard the truth probably himself and rejected it, rebelled against it, and said, no, this is not for me. But he didn't want his brothers coming there. Send Lazarus back that he may tell them the truth. You see, there's a, an insight into what happens. We die without Christ. This man who fared sumptuously every day, he had absolutely everything. And friends, that's why we preach the Word of God. We don't preach some ideas of our own. We don't preach some fanciful story. We preach the Word of God. The hymn says, I must needs go home. By the way of the cross, there's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. That's why Peter's talking about the cross in his epistle. He wants men and women to understand there's no other way to God but through the cross. And Jesus is the one that introduces us to God. He brings us to God. And gives us a relationship with God that is eternal. Abraham Lincoln had a son called Thad. And Thad had a terribly bad cleft palate and had a deep, deep speech impediment. And it seemed he had a special place in his father, Abraham Lincoln's heart, the president then of America. Some backwoods men had come to see the president and the authorities, the Officials wouldn't let them in and chase them. 
because they were scruffy looking and all the rest of it and spoke with rather thick accents. And they came out and they weren't happy and the president's son was standing. He knew them. He called them over. He said, good to see you boys because he had lived amongst them a few years before. What's the problem? We tried to get into the president, but his, his age wouldn't let us. Dad says, you really want to see the president? Really important? Sure, come with me. And Thad walked up with these men and the aides at the front door just stood aside and the doors opened and in went Thad. Walked into the next level and again the aides now, the senators were all standing around and they just stepped aside and Thad and the, the woodsmen walked in, in through another door and his close advisors just stood to the side and Thad and the men walked in and he walked in and closed the door behind him. He says, Dad, you know who these men are. They're my friends from where we lived before. They want to see you. They have a problem. Please, can they speak with you? He said, Son, anyone that is a friend of yours is a friend of mine. You see, that's what <coughs> Jesus is saying to us today. That's what he said in the Bible to those who were saved. He says, I call you not servants, but friends. Jesus wants to make us a friend. But more than that, he wants us, uh, he wants to bring us to his Father that we might become the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ and have an eternal relationship with his Father that we'll never be separated again. You see, salvation, dear friends, is never by chance but it's not without choice. And that's what we have to do this evening. We've got to make a choice. He gives us this amazing text and he reminds us of all that the cross is. He reminds us, and it's an amazing thing when we think about it. He reminds us of the purpose of the cross. He reminds us of the price of the cross. He reminds us of the permanence of the cross. And he reminds us of the power of the cross. And he says, if you come to Jesus, he'll bring you to God. And you'll be one forever. You'll never again be separated. Salvation is never by chance. But it's not without choice. And the choice, dear friend, is yours. I wonder what that choice will be. This is the 42nd anniversary of this church. Many have come here and heard the Lord, heard his word and been saved. You know what? They will forever be near to God because of Jesus. And they will forever be with the Lord because they believe their choice. No one can make the choice for you. You, dear friend, and you alone must make that choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.